Bayman, the pirate lumberjacks. Life would be pretty boring without color, and people have throughout history looked for methods to dye their clothes in pretty colors. Because of this, dyes have always been a valuable trade commodity. When the Spanish started colonizing the New World, they immediately began looking for new ways to color their clothes, like indigo and cochineal. Indigo, as you might know, has a distinctive blue color. Indigo dye was made by cutting the indigo plant in short lengths, tying the cuttings into bundles, and letting them rot in cisterns of water. This mess was then stirred, and when the plants had completely rotted, the stalks were removed and the cistern dried, leaving behind a mass that was molded into bricks of dye. Indigo produced in Saint-Domingue was possibly used by French flibustiers to color their trademark sackcloth coats, which were known to be blue. Cochineal is, strangely enough, an insect. When grounded up, it produced an excellent scarlet color called grana fina by the Spanish. Today it is usually called carmine and is even used in food coloring. You will eat the bugs! The insect feeds on nopal prickly pear cacti and was cultivated by the Spanish on special cactus farms in Mexico. The star of this video is the dye harvested by the baymen, logwood. Logwood, known as palo de campeche or campeche wood, originates from the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. They thrive the best near coastal mangroves in yellow clay with an upper surface of rich black mold, though not very deep, they don't want too much mold. The logwood is very beautiful and was often confused by the English for the white thorn, but interestingly the logwood isn't technically a tree, but a legume, the same as a bean. That always struck me as pretty weird, but hey, I like beans. The wood chips extracted from the logwood are used for producing a rich purple, that was commonly used as a base for dark purple or even black. Black was very expensive and only worn by the aristocracy of the time. Logwood dye would also be used as an ink, and the wood had medicinal uses. It burned very well, and was used to harness the frisson in flintlocks. The Spanish began harvesting logwood at the river of Champoton in Yucatan. They hired natives to harvest it for only a real a day, and it never formed a major part of the local industry. After the English conquest of Jamaica in 1655, English privateers cruising in Mexico discovered the logwood aboard the Spanish barks they captured. They thought the wood worthless and usually just burned the barks to acquire their ironwork. The privateers then learned the hard way just how expensive the logwood was after they had burned away too many shipments of it. Whoops. They decided to roam the Yucatan coast in search for harvesting sites and even places where they could cut it themselves. However, the logwood trade remained quite minor for these first few years. After all, it was easier and more profitable to just pirate from the Spanish. But in 1671, England and Spain suddenly decided to sign a peace treaty leaving hundreds of privateers without employment. Since they had all spent their earnings on wine and women, no one was really able to retire. In desperation, they turned to piracy, fought against the Dutch or entered French service in Petit Gua. Some turned to the so-called sloop trade, which was an illicit trade with the Spanish colonies, conducted from, you guessed it, schooners. No sloops, of course. The logwood trade was essentially an extension of the sloop trade. More and more former buccaneers settled across Yucatan to harvest logwood, which was completely illegal. The Spanish owned the region and did not want trespassers. What they were doing was certainly profitable, but dangerous on so many levels, ranging from their neighbors to the nature itself. This we'll discover in the upcoming parts. But how did the baymen actually live? There are many parallels between the baymen and the buccaneers. If you watched my video on the buccaneers, you'll know that they were French hunters that hunted stray pigs and cattle on the island of Hispaniola. Both the baymen and buccaneers lived rough but healthy and egalitarian lives. They frequently fought against the Spanish and were frontiersmen limited only by their own ambition. Both of them frequented between pirating and their bushman trade. William Dampier, who lived amongst the baymen, stated that there were roughly 300 former privateers and sailors actively working as logwood cutters during the 1670s. By the early 1700s, there were no more than a thousand logwood cutters active in the region, according to speculation by the historian David Cordingley. The Baymen didn't live as one big tribe, but rather in small companies of three to ten men, settled at the most convenient place for cutting. They would often recruit at the end of a season when the logwood had been cut and needed to be carried away. The carrying was the heaviest work, so it would serve as a trial of sorts for the recruit. After the carriage was over, a payment was agreed upon, and the recruit would properly join the company. Every Bayman was paid in logwood, which he had to sell himself. In terms of looks and clothing, they would have worn the typical seaman slops, but much more ragged, similar to the buccaneers. They were heavily tanned, stank, and rarely shaved. Carrying and cutting all that wood made them strong and sturdy fellows. They could purportedly carry burdens of three to four hundred weight. 
All of them wore hats, possibly the cropped hat we had described by Dampier, which had its brim cut on the sides so that only a frontal screen remained, oddly similar to a baseball cap. Lionel Wafer also said that they made tobacco pouches from pelican cheeks. Whilst the Bucanis were mostly French, with a splish splash of mulattoes and other nationalities, the Baymen were mostly from the British Isles. There were Irishmen like Mr. Daniel, who survived the crocodile attack. Dampier himself worked with three Scotsmen. The young merchant sons George and Duncan Campbell, and Price Morris, the master of a large piragua. The terrain was hard to walk in, so the Baymen used piraguas and canoes to travel by river. The Baymen built their settlements in lagoons and the mouth of creeks. They settled close to the beach for the benefit of the sea breeze. The land was hot and they lacked air conditioning after all. They built crude huts and thatched their roofs with palm leaves to prevent their violent rains from getting in. For bedding they built wooden frames or barbecues, these standing three feet high above the ground, since the ground would be flooded during the wet season. The bed was surrounded by four wooden stakes holding a cloth pavilion to keep the mosquitoes out. They had an earthen hearth for cooking and a barbecue table where they ate. But what food did they eat? The staple consisted of peas and the bread known as doughboys, possibly ship's biscuit. They often purchased flour to make their own doughboys. They would forage for whatever fruits were available, such as the coca plum. And as for meat, they purchased pork, but mostly hunted. We'll discuss hunting later. The baymen structured their work schedules around the seasons. During the dry season, they cut down trees. Whilst they primarily chopped logwood, they also cut small amounts of bloodwood, stockfish wood, and possibly whatever else was available. Cutting down the trees was hard work. The trees were 5 to 6 feet in circumference, and some had to be blasted in two with gunpowder. When the trunk fell down, they cut into the logs and shipped off the bark to expose the brown, reddish heartwood. When the wet season came, they loaded the shipped logs into their piraguas and canoes and brought them down to the beach where they stored them until the ship arrived. Carrying the logs was the heaviest work, but they had no bosses and would carry as little as they wanted. But they were usually able, diligent and willing to show off. However, they only worked five days a week. On Sundays they rested, and on Saturdays they hunted. Much like the buccaneers, the baymen were excellent shooters. They were veteran buccaneers, after all, who had fought with the likes of Henry Morgan on the fields near Puerto Principe and Panama. They hunted cattle that inhabited the savannas deeper inland, where they traveled by canoa. The cattle would often go down into the river itself to bathe and to drink, and became easy targets, but not an easy prey. The canoe had to be pointed against the beast, because if the beast was wounded, it would charge the canoe and capsize it if it rammed the side, spoiling all the arms and ammunition, and exposing the baymen to the creepy creatures of the water. Dampier noted that the cows were often more dangerous than the bulls, since they wouldn't close their eyes when charging. If they hunted on land, a few men would scare the cattle into the forest, where another group would lie in wait to shoot them. If there were more than four men in the hunting party, the exes would cook the meat while the rest sought more game. If a party member got lost, they would hang up their hats on sticks so he could trace his way back to camp, kinda like Hansel and Gretel. The goal was to acquire enough meat to supply them for the coming week. The cattle were large and fat during springtime, and lean the rest of the year, but always tasty. When a bee was killed, it was divided into four quarters, the bones removed, and each man given a quarter. He would then cut a hole into his piece and wear it like a cloak to carry home. If he tired of the weight, he would cut off a bit and throw it away. Much like their buccaneer cousins, the baymen might go and hunt beeves for their hides. After skinning a bullock, they would stretch out the skin with pegs to dry them, the hairy side up. Once a month, they would beat out the worms that bred in the hide. Before shipping the hides off, they would soak them in salt water to kill the remaining worms, and afterwards fold and dry them. The baymen were content to work hard, except for when the traders came from Jamaica or New England. These were sloops or catches loaded with rum and sugar, which the baymen gladly blew their money on. If the ship's captain treated the baymen with punch, he would be much respected and given the best wood. However, if he was a greedy man, they would give him special logs that had been hollowed out and filled with dirt. Dampier reckoned the logwood trade to be the most potentially profitable in England, but it was unable to match the profits from the slavery or tobacco by far. David Cordling said that the logwood cutting was a minor industry carried out by a few hundred ex-seamen and pirates in a remote corner of the globe. Another commodity the Bayman loved was tobacco, and they smoked a lot. They smoked from long shock pipes or cheaper red clay pipes, and would store the tobacco in the aforementioned pouches made from pelican sacks. In these pouches they kept a claw from a very large spider, which was used to scrape the pipe clean. It must not be understated how much the Bayman loved to drink. They drank rum punch, wine, ale, and cider by the barrel. Dampier described them as bizarre, these men that worked so hard and honestly, 
wanted to squander their earnings on drinking and making fools of themselves. They were rude people who said whatever they wanted and cursed profanely, spending three or four days in aggressive bouts of drinking, enlivened by the firing of the traders' cannons and necessity when toasting someone's health. They drank until they dropped senseless, and when they woke, they would start drinking again. It is no wonder that the baymen drank this much, because no matter how honest their work was, it was a living hell. The Yucatan Peninsula has been described as the most hostile and alien environment on Earth. I've heard it likened to Mars or the Moon more than any other place on Earth. The baymen lived in reeking mangrove swamps infested by massive mosquitoes, hostile animals and parasites. The most feared of the animals was the alligator. They inhabited the creeks, rivers and lagoons all over the Bay of Campeche. The ones in Yucatan were around 17 feet long and as thick as a colt. They have dark brown scales and long jaws with strong teeth. Baymen would sometimes hunt alligators but often avoided it due to the strong smell of the meat. This, uh, this smell is produced by a certain cod grown at the groin and breast, which were dried by the baymen and kept in their hats as a perfume. Despite their size, the alligators are actually quite harmless. Dampier once tripped four times over an alligator at once and expected to be devoured, but the <laughs> lizard didn't care. More threatening were the smaller crocodiles, who would sometimes go into baymen camps in search for food. Crocodiles posed a severe danger to the baymen when hunting. If an angry beef tipped their boat, they were prime dining for the hungry crocs. The baymen sometimes hunted crocodiles since their meat was tastier than the alligators. The crocodiles themselves had a taste for dog meat, so the baymen's dogs were usually terrified of going close to bodies of water and neither their drink fetched to them. A group of baymen were out hunting when a straggler in their company, Daniel, the aforementioned Irishman, was caught by a crocodile. Upon hearing Daniel screaming, the company fled, thinking that the Spaniards caught him. When the crocodile opened its jaws to get a better hold, as they often do, he snatched away his bitten knee and placed the butt of his gun into the jaws. Daniel escaped and climbed into a tree where he was eventually rescued by his mates. When next they found the gun, it had two large holes in the butt. Daniel went to Boston where his leg was cured, and though he returned to Campeche, he would limp ever after. A more comedic but still unpleasant beast were the wild monkeys, which Dampier described as the ugliest he ever saw. They kept together in groups of 30 and would leap from the trees to a tree and make noise. Whenever they met a person, they would start dancing and chattering, throw sticks and even their feces and urine. They would meet other animals too, like the armadillo, sloth and porcupine. The one animal that the baymen did respect, and superstitiously so, were carrion crows. The white carrion crows were called king carrion crows by the baymen. They would never shoot them, and on Jamaica there was even a law that prevented their hunting. Superstition aside, the carrion crows kept the land sanitary by eating rotten carcasses. Poisonous snakes and spiders, mosquitoes and angry ants with fiery bites posed some of the less than pleasant critters. Possibly the most terrifying threat was the most subtle, a parasite called guinea worm. The parasite dwells in shallow waters waded by the baymen and would be ingested when it consumed bad water. After copulating, the male worms die in the stomach and the females burrow into the skin of the host. Eventually they start emerging into the feet and ankles in the form of angry red boils, but one should be careful about extracting them. If the worm breaks, the flesh will putrefy and endanger the patient's life. Oh, and these worms can grow up to 80 centimeters. Yeah. Anyone that says it was a paradise living like a bayman, they do not know what they're talking about. To remove them, the worm has to be gently rolled out inch by inch. If the worm starts resisting, you need to stop rolling, lest it breaks. This extraction is necessary, but it's also painful. Dampier, who caught the worm, eventually visited a witch doctor to get cured. The witch doctor stroked the sore, then mumbled some choice words, applied it with a mystical powder, blew on the sore, and waved his hands over it. His fee for the cure was a white rooster. As I've talked about many times on this channel, the Spanish Empire laid claim to all of the Americas and saw it as property granted to them by God. The Yucatan was no different. Though a hostile environment, the Spanish had built a few settlements there, inhabited mostly by converted natives. They worked in salt raking and the cotton industry, and almost exclusively wore cotton clothes, straw hats and no shoes. They had Christian names, but the saints in their churches were painted in their own skin color. As for food, Dampier mentioned tortilla bread as one of their favorites. As we know from the video about the Buccaneers, the Spanish had released cattle into the wilds to sustain future generations of colonists. The Spanish method of hunting cattle was by hoxing. The hoxer was mounted on a good horse and given a hoxing iron, a 14-foot pole with an iron crescent. The hoxer lays the pole over the head of his horse and charges at the prey, which he strikes and hamstrings. 
When the beast is disabled, he rides up and cuts a throat and rides on to hunt more game, leaving the butchering and skidding to his servants. The Spanish were very deliberate and careful in their hunting. They hunted only the bulls and old cows, leaving the young cattle to breed and preserve a good stock. The baymen and buccaneers, on the other hand, killed without distinction. When England conquered Jamaica in 1655, their troops almost starved after they carelessly killed all the cattle on the island. These different methods of hunting naturally led to tensions between the Spanish and the interlopers, but that doesn't mean that all of them were unwilling to share the cattle with the baymen. Juan de Acosta was a resident of San Francisco de Campeche, who owned a nearby island that the baymen would frequent in search of cattle. One day he visited the island and found some baymen shooting his beasts and told them to stop, saying it would make them wild. One might expect Juan to become a mortal enemy with the baymen, but he thought they made excellent partners. Since Juan only hunted for hides and tallow, why shouldn't he be able to supply the baymen with meat? They hunted only for food after all. The baymen became such good friends with Juan that they intended to bring presents from Jamaica and goods to trade with him. Sadly, the governor of Campeche disliked this notion and had Juan imprisoned. The Spanish responded aggressively to the interlopers. In half galleys and piraguas they roamed the coast of Yucatan. These were the Garda Costa, little better than pirates themselves, though they were called pirate hunters. They boarded any English vessel, took all their goods and obviously killed all the crew. Spanish soldiers stormed the Bayman camps by surprise and dragged them off one by one from their huts. Prisoners were taken to one of the cities before being sent to Mexico, where they were purchased as slaves by the tradesmen. However, Dampier suggested that these prisoners were treated reasonably enough and were never sent to the silver mines. Either way, after spending three or four years in captivity and learning Spanish, the captive bayman would make his escape, possibly making his way back to Europe via the treasure fleet. Many baymen were understandably displeased from having their ships taken by the Garda, and often returned to their old trade of piracy. The baymen made for perfect pirates. They were used to hardship, had a savage and willful mentality, and were good marksmen. After the war of Spanish succession, many baymen joined the flying gang of Nassau after losing their peaceful livelihood to the Spanish. However, pirates like Blackbeard would themselves make prizes of logwood carriers. Their pirate mentality often made them restless. When they weren't taking out their aggressions by drinking, blowing up trees or hunting, they roamed the rivers and coasts in search for plunder. I have heard it said by some internet hacks that the Baymen had good relations with the natives, but this was usually not the case. They would plunder Indian villages and sell off the men and boys as slaves in Jamaica and take the women for their own usage. History is rarely pretty, but it is seldom pure ugly, and there were instances of friendly relations between the Yucatan natives and Baymen. Many of the natives felt unhappy under the oppressive Spaniards and would sometimes escape entire villages at once. They had few belongings, and other than their calabashes and hammocks, and could live off wild animals, fruits, and secret gardens, the locations known only to them. In some cases they would come and live with the Baymen, but overall it doesn't seem like the Yucatan natives had as good a relation with the pirates as the mosquitoes or Darien natives did. Let's take a look at a comment from last week. Edward Teach himself wants me to cover more Spanish pirates. I do know about how these Spanish pirates operated and will cover them in broad strokes, but sadly I don't know how enough about any individuals at the moment, but it's something for the future. Thank you everyone else for your comments. This week, why don't you tell me if you'd like to become a bayman? Will the payment be worth the risks? Maybe you'd like to be a buccaneer instead. Huge thanks to all of my supporters on Patreon, Cole Freer, Max Dweck, Peter Tissen, RadRady88, and Michael Jans. If you want to support me monetarily, please check out the links in the description to my PayPal and Patreon. Otherwise, leave a like and a comment on the video to help the algorithm in spreading the video. Cheers.